There are few things that people find more frightening or, in a lot of cases, more annoying than this, this sign right here. The end is near. I mean, now, if you're in the city streets and you see somebody holding that sign, come on, who's going to be honest enough to say, yeah, that's an annoyance I don't need. Uh, but if we're on enough, honest enough to talk about the moments when we think about it, it's not just an annoyance. It's something that creates a lot of fear and anxiety, right? So how many of you would agree with the sentiment that the end is near? Just wave your hand at me if you're like, you agree. Yeah, the end is near. Now, you should know me better than this by now because I just laid a trap for you. Uh, that is not the case. The end is not near. 100% the, the end is not anywhere close. It's not the end that is near. It is the next that is near. It's the next that's near. Listen, eschatology means the end of time or the study of the end of time. But how many of you realize that time's not going to end when Jesus comes back? That time, it's not over. It's not done. Time's not over. We just nicknamed it the end of time, and it's not the end of time at all. Time is going to go on for eternity. This is not the end of time. It's just the next. And the next should be an exciting proposition for you if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Come on, somebody. If you know Jesus as your Lord, then what's coming next should be exciting to you, should be encouraging to you. You should be something that you're looking forward to. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I hope that today is the day that you put your faith and hope and trust in him. And you say that this moment is the day you make Jesus the Lord of your life. You see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks about what's next on the heavenly timeline. It talks, uh, almost that entire chapter is about what's next on the heavenly timeline. And do you know what it says? It says that we should be really nervous and uncomfortable about what's coming next. If you've been paying attention in this series, that is not what it says at all. Not even close. What it actually says is this. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So this subject, eschatology, Jesus coming back, the end of the world as we know it, this is not something we're supposed to avoid as followers of Christ. It's supposed to be what we use to encourage one another. We should be like, hey, man, what's going on? Are you going through a rough time? I like, yeah, man, I'm just going through a big struggle right now. My job sucks. I hate it. I don't even understand what I'm doing in life. And our response to this should be, well, guess what? We're not ignorant about what's coming next like the people without any hope. We know that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you and I are going to be caught up into the air to be with Jesus. Come on, somebody. And every hard thing that we've ever dealt with all of a sudden will mean nothing. When was the last time? Thank you very much. When was the last time that you were down and out? Raise your hand if you've ever been down and out. Yeah, we all have. When was the last time you were down and out and you were talking to a close friend, said, man, I'm really discouraged. And they said, well, let me tell you about what's coming next. Let me tell you about the rapture of the church. Let me tell you about the second coming of Christ. Let me tell you about the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Raise your hand if that has happened zero times. Every hand in this room ought to be up because I'm betting that has never happened to any of us ever. I know it's never happened to me. Yet this is what Paul says. We should in, this should be in our encouragement. When we're trying to encourage other people, this is what ought to get us excited. Is that, think about it. I want you right now, this might be a little depressing, I'm sorry, but just for a split second, I want you to think of the hardest, most unpleasant circumstance of your life. Just do it for, for two seconds. And I want you to realize that in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, when we get caught up into the air to be with Jesus, it won't mean anything. 
it won't mean a hill of beans next to eternity. It might seem like a big deal right now, but friends, I promise you, in that moment, you will be like, what was I so upset about that for? When we get our eyes on what is next, we get encouraged. In fact, if you are struggling with something today, if you're worried, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you're feeling down, or if you're just one of those people that just doesn't have any optimism about the future, let me encourage you with these words. Jesus is coming back, and he loves you, and he's going to rapture you out of here. Come on, somebody. So let's get excited, and let's get into the Word of God today. Can we do that? Yeah. Come on, give somebody a high five and just say, dude, this is going to be awesome. All right, so last week we learned that some of the most exciting words that we can hear at church are, open your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. So we can do that again today. Open your Bibles to Leviticus. We're going to go to chapter 23, verse 24, and it's verse 34, you're right, uh, and it says this. <coughs> Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the festival of shelters on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the Day of Atonement. This festival to the Lord will last seven days. And then jump down to verse 42. For seven days you must live outside in little shelters. All native-born Israelites must live in little shelters. Uh, it says just shelters there. This will remind, look at this, this will remind each new generation of Israelites that I made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I want you to notice that God required that his people intentionally and deliberately moved out of their homes and stayed in, quote, little shelters. Now, if you, depending on the translation of Bible that you use, the word little shelters is actually translated a whole lot of different ways. Uh, some will say uh, booths, which is really hard to say. It's like Thessalonians. It's, it's hard to say it without lisping. And uh, some will say tabernacles and all this. But how many of you know what the children of Israel stayed in in the book of Exodus as they were wandering the desert? How many of you know what that is? It was tents, right? That, that's, that's what they stayed in. They stayed in tents. And so it was a probably not, you know, the dome, bamboo, toss and shoot up tents that we know today, but it would have been fabric, you know, some kind of fabric structure held up by sticks. Uh, but that's what they were staying in. And I want you to notice that the intent of this, okay, let's be real about what they were doing. They were camping. Right? This was a camping trip. How many of you think that we should honor God by going camping at least seven days a year? Uh, come on, Idaho. There's more of you that think we need to do that, right? You've got hand raise fatigue, I think, from all the hand raising so far. Uh, <laughs> but I want you to notice that the intent of this camping trip was specifically to remind the future generations about how God had delivered them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. I mean, can you imagine? We have nothing like this today where we move out of our homes for seven days specifically to teach our children about something that happened in the past. Can you even imagine? Seven days. I mean, that's a long time to camp <laughs> for me. I, lo I love camping for two days. I have a camper, so I like camping, you know, five days even because I can take a shower and there's heat and it's a flat level surface. Seven days in a tent, I mean, that is hardcore. I mean, that's like, you know, Wilderness Robinson family or something like that. That is, that is, that is like extremist level camping. Imagine we did that with our kids for seven days specifically to remind them of something they that God has done. How many of you know that by the time those children are grown up, they're never, ever, ever going to forget about that camping trip you took every year? This was a powerful reminder for the children of Israel to remember how God had delivered them from the land of Egypt. 
And if you remember, each and every one of these seven feasts and festivals were intended to point back to what God had done in the past. And, everybody say and. And each and every one of them were foreshadowing something that was going to take place in the future from the time it was written in the book of Leviticus. Four of those seven things have already been fulfilled in the future from Leviticus, but the past to you and me, and that was Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, fr- fruits, first fruits, which were all pointing to Jesus. Come on, that ought to make somebody smile in this place. All of those were pointing back to what God had done in the past, but they were pointing forward to Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus removed our sin, and Jesus declared victory over death. Those were the first three, which we studied in the spring. Then there's Pentecost. God looked back at the, the peop- in, at the festival of Pentecost. It was called the Feast of Weeks back in the ancient uh, text, and it looked back at God's provision for them. Many people speculate that at Pentecost is when the Ten Commandments were actually given to Moses. Some people will say that's a fact. I would like to because that's really cool, but I've been unsuccessful in trying to prove that with any biblical text. So I'll give you a solid maybe on that. Uh, But it looked back to God's spiritual provision, and on the day of Pentecost is when God poured out his spirit on all mankind. Come on, that is so awesome. So these four have been fulfilled, and it's easy to look back and to see that. The fall festivals point to a future that has not yet happened to you and I today. The Feast of Trumpets, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, I believe is pointing to the rapture of the church. Then there's the Day of Atonement we talked about last week that points to that terrible and wonderful day of the Lord when Jesus returns to the earth and sets his feet back down here on earth. And then there's the Festival of Shelters, and it points to what? What do you think that points to? So we'll talk about it here. Let me ask you this. What is next on the heavenly timeline? How many of you know that there is a heavenly timeline? Come on, just wave your hand to me. I know. Uh, You're just getting stronger. Just alternate. You don't have to. I didn't say right hand or left hand. Just, you know, respond. There is a heavenly timeline, and there's so many people in our culture today that say, well, what has been has always been, and therefore nothing's ever going to change. But how many know that's an objectively false statement, that what has been, has, what is now has not always been? That, abs- that, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Even if you're sitting in this room and you're an atheist, which seems unlikely, but even if that's true and you're an atheist in the room or you're an atheist watching online... Even an atheist would not say that what is has always been. An atheist, even the uh, secular scientists would agree that the earth has not been eternal and that at one point in time, although they would say it was billions and billions and billions of years ago, that once there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was something that came out of nothing for no reason. It, it's amazing the faith it would take to be a uh, an atheist. <laughs> I just don't have enough faith to believe that all of this came from nothing for no reason and with no catalyst. So at one point in time, everything that we currently know did not exist. Think about that. Everything that we currently know did not exist because there is a timeline, at least for us. You see, once upon a time, the earth and the stars and the heavens did not exist. Wave your hand at me if you know that. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or a, a, you know, a, a scientific Christian that believes in evolution and all that. Even if you're an atheist, we all believe that there was a point before this earth existed. Now, we may have wildly different opinions about how they came into existence and when they came into existence, 
Let me tell you how, what I believe. I do not believe that the earth is 4.5 billion years old, which is what Google will tell you if you look it up. I don't believe that the universe is 13 to 14 to 15 billion years old. It keeps changing, so I don't know what the current uh, response on Google would be for that. I believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old, and you might be thinking, Pastor, you're crazy. The cheese has slid off your cracker. Science has overwhelmingly proven that the earth is ancient in the extreme. And let me help you with something today. That is a false statement. Science has absolutely not proven anything of the sort. There's two types of science. There's really only one true type of science, but there's two types of science that people claim today. First is observable science. That is a science where you can, uh, you can test things, you can run experiments. Which, how come we have cell phones and uh, we have strong building materials, we have concrete, we have all of the things that you and I know and enjoy is because scientists and chemists and people have invented and created these things because it's in, in things like medicine have been created because people have been able to observe the reaction of things, to test these things and to see if they're repeatable. Science is observable, it's testable, and it is repeatable. That's what real science is. And real science over and over and over again validates and proves that the Bible is true and that God is real and has never done anything to, to, to prove anything to the contrary no matter what people try to tell you. Then there's historical science. This is something called science. It's not scientific at all. It cannot be observed, cannot be tested, and it cannot be repeated. It's when we look back and, and put a number on creation, like a billion years ago or even 10,000 years ago. I love to go down to Shoshone Falls and you see the, all the beautiful signs they have down there that talk about how the canyon was created. And it was all from the Bonneville flood that occurred 10,000 years ago, which is curious because that means that flood occurred about 4,000 years before the earth existed. So it, 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 it's not true. Even though it is overwhelmingly accepted by the secular community, that the reality is about 6,000 years ago was when God created the earth, and it was after that that the stars and the sky were created. If you know your story, if you know your Bible, in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and then later created the stars at night and the sky and everything like that. So before there was anything out there, then there was a next. Come on, are you with me? Once there was nothing, then God said, next. God spoke, and in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, and then all of a sudden, there was a next. There was a perfect world that God created, and he put Adam and Eve in there to tend the garden, and how many of you know what happened to that? Come on, if, if we don't, we can get our children's ministry team to come in here with the flannel graphs. We can explain it. How many know that Adam and Eve sinned? And all of a sudden, what was, wasn't anymore, there was a next. And because sin came into the world, the world was corrupted. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. And sin and strange flesh lived on the earth. Did you know this? Did you know the Bible says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they came down and had uh, sexual relations with them and created offspring that was not entirely human. This is where a lot of people believe that the, the, the stories of mythology and the, the superpowers and, and things that people had in ancient world, it may not be completely made up. It's based on the fact that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and God said, or the Bible says it, they created strange flesh. God didn't like what was going on in the earth, so guess what he said? He said, next. Then there was a real flood that covered the entire earth and wiped away everything that was on the earth at that time. What was left on the earth? Just the people that were in that ark and the animals that were in the ark. That's it. Everything else was wiped away. Mankind... After this time, mankind began to flourish, and all of man spoke the same language. And they, they, <clears throat> the Bible says that nothing was impossible for them. 
You know, it's, it's fascinating to me as we look back on the people of that age and we assume we're more intelligent than they are. We assume that we're like, well, there's, th- this is exactly why many people believe that aliens built the pyramids because there's no logical explanation that mankind, because we think we're the smart ones and everybody before us was the poor dumb ones, but the Bible says that at the, around the tower, time of the Tower of Babel that there was nothing impossible for them. I've never seen a scripture where God says that about us today. It seems a lot of things are impossible for us today, but nothing was impossible for them. So for us to assume that we're more intelligent than they are or they were, that's just an assumption that we're making out of our own arrogance and, frankly, our stupidity. The reality is the, the architecture that exists from that era testifies that people were vastly more intelligent than maybe we are today. But they, they, didn't, they weren't happy with being just intelligent. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to build a tower that would reach into the heavens. And guess what happened? God said, next. God said, next. And then God scattered them around the face of the globe, and he confused their language. Before that time, it was one way. Then after that time, it was another way. Then God chose Abraham to be a chosen nation among the people. And this is the nation of Israel. And these people were led and blessed by God. And through keeping the law of Moses and through blood sacrifices, these chosen people were able to have what no other humans had had since Adam, is they were able to have a relationship with Almighty God. But this was just a foreshadow of the kind of relationship God wanted to have with people. So guess what happened? God said, next And then guess what? For unto us a child was born. Unto us a Savior was given. Come on, somebody. Jesus came and fulfilled the law of God, and then he was crucified according to the Scriptures. Jesus died and was buried. And then three days and three nights later, Jesus rose from the grave. Come on. All of mankind now had a way to find redemption and relationship with God. But guess what happened? Then God said, next, again. Just 50 days after Christ was crucified for us, God said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and God pours out his Spirit on all flesh on the day of Pentecost. Come on, you you know... All of this stuff is familiar to us. But before the day of Pentecost had fully come, it wasn't the same way as it was after that. This began what we know as the church age, which we've been in the church age from that day to this. Friends, it is not the end that is near. It is the next. It's the next that is near. And if you can be grateful for all the previous nexts, Of all the other times that God said next, if you can look back and you're grateful that God created the heavens and the earth, if you're grateful for what he's done, you're grateful that he chose Israel, you're grateful that he sent Jesus, you're grateful that he sent his Holy Spirit, if you can be grateful and excited about all the previous times that God said next, then you can be excited and optimistic looking forward to the next time that he's going to say next. Amen? Amen. So next for us is the rapture of the church. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be raptured up to be with Jesus in the air. Then the return of Jesus to the earth. And after that is the millennial reign of Jesus. The festival of shelters, I believe, points back to remind us how God miraculously delivered his people out of Egypt. But it also points forward to the millennial reign of Christ on the earth when you and I will dwell with Jesus in that special time for a thousand years. Now listen, you might say, well, Pastor Jeremy, I don't agree with that conclusion. Whenever we're looking backwards, hindsight can be near 2020. 
But looking forward, there's an element of speculation that we have to employ. So I will admit, maybe we don't have this figured out. But I have done considerable research on this topic, hours and hours and hours of study. And I think it is highly likely that this is what the Festival of Shelters points to. I am, however, 100% certain that the 1,000-year reign of Jesus will happen. It absolutely will happen, and it is something that all followers of Jesus should be aware of and should be looking forward to. Amen? And I think it's a very sad testament to our Christian culture today that for the most part, I'm telling you, I, I couldn't give you a statistic on this, but very very few Christian churches that exist today will ever talk about this subject or talk about it very much at all. But this is something that we ought to be aware of and we ought to be looking forward to. The millennial reign of Jesus is a fascinating time in Scripture. I mean, it, it, it's going to be truly remarkable and amazing. One of the reasons that we think that the Festival of Shelters points to the millennial reign of Christ is because we know that during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the festival of shelters will still be practiced. It's going to be something that we're still doing. So if you're like, oh, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. Well, get used to it, baby, because you're going to be doing it for a long time. We're, we're going to be participating in the festival of shelters in the millennial reign. Hopefully we won't be chastised too much for not having done it for several hundred years as a Christian culture. But trust me, when Jesus comes back and he sets up his kingdom for the thousand-year reign, we, you and I are going to be participating in the festival of shelters in the millennium or what's, what many people call the kingdom age. We're still going to celebrate the festival of shelters. Look at this. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 16 says this. In the end, the enemies of Jerusalem who survived the plague will go up to Jerusalem each year to worship the king, the Lord of heaven's armies, and to celebrate the festival of shelters. Now, I want you to uh, look at the first. Can you go back one screen? I want to go um, look at that. In the end, the enemies of Jerusalem who survived the plague. I want you to to. Notice the word survive the plague. Now, this is another place that depending on your translation, it's worded very differently in a lot of different translations of the Bible. But let me help you understand what that's referring to. It's referring to the tribulation. The, this, the people, the enemies that, that survive the plague are people who live through the tribulation. So you and I are going to get raptured up, and then there's a great tribulation. We talked about that last week. And it's going to be worse than anything that has ever happened on this earth. Nothing else can even compare to it. And the Bible says that the vast majority of people on the earth are going to be wiped out. It, it's going to be unbelievable. Billions and billions of people are going to lose their lives. But not everybody. There will still be people who live through that entire time and survive all that. Those are the people that this verse is referring to. And... Uh, that's what that's talking about. So let's go on to verse 17. Any nation in the world that refuses to come to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of heaven's armies, will have no reign. If the people of Egypt refuse to attend the festival, the Lord will punish them with the same plague that he sends on the other nations who refuse to go. Egypt and the other nations will be punished if they, do, if they don't go to celebrate the festival of shelters. So this is referring to the, the time of the millennial reign of Christ. This is the future. And we see that we will still be celebrating the festival of shelters at that time. Now, is it okay with you if we just read about the, the millennial reign of Christ? I mean, just, is anybody in here curious? Uh, would it be okay if we just read some of this and talk about it? I hope so. If you have your own Bible here, I would encourage you to get your own Bible out. I think some passages, I think it's fine to read on the screen. I ain't got no problem with that. If I did, we wouldn't put them up. But I think it's good for you to read some things in your own Bible, even if it's your Bible app on your phone. So I would encourage you to do that. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 20, 
And we're going to read a lot of this chapter. So let's go to verse 1 and start there. And it says this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. Come on, how many of you could just hear the sound of a heavy chain? I don't know how heavy the chain has to be to be a, a chain that an angel would carry, but this has got to be a pretty heavy chain. I'm, I'm envisioning like boat anchor chain. You're talking heavy, heavy chain. I don't know. It might be a ball chain. I don't know, but it says the chain, so I'm imagining. I want you to hear that sound of the heavy chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterwards, he must be released for a little while. I want you to notice several things in this passage. Number one, he's talking about heavy chain. That's just cool. Number two, who does the angel bind up with that heavy chain. And it, it's amazing how there's no ambiguity about who we're talking about here. It says he sees the dragon, the, that old serpent, who was the devil, Satan. Just so you were clear on who we're talking about, that this we're talking about the one, the only, Satan the devil. This is no, we, we want to make it very clear he's not talking about somebody else. Because here's what I think a lot of people do today. They tend to, to see God and Satan as equal opposites or even maybe near equal opposites. Like here's God and here's Satan just a little bit weaker. And it's like a nail biter. How's this thing going to end? Who, who's this, you know? And, and people fear today the power of Satan. But you, you really should not. You should just get excited about the power of God. You see, we have this need as storytellers. I mean, think about it. I want you to think about every superhero story that has ever been told in all the history of every superhero story that has existed in the totality of mankind. Every superhero needs a what? A nemesis, right? Nobody wants to see the movie where Superman has, goes unchallenged for the entire movie, right? And, and, you know, they all have the same cadence, right? It's like the first few, he's just dealing with, you know, bad guys, crooks, and there's no contest. The superhero is, is dynamically more powerful. But in order for the story to be engaging, somewhere along the way, there has to be a nemesis, some other superpower villain that can bring a challenge to our hero. And almost every last one of them, it's so close. It's so close. They, almost, they were almost defeated, right? The new Marvel movie where the, the, the hero is almost defeated but prevails in the end. Isn't that the plot to every last one of them, right? Every last one of them because that's the way we need to tell a story. And because of that, because we don't study our scriptures, we tend to see Jesus and the devil like that. Like there's Jesus and then there's Satan and it's like there's this war going back and forth and it's so close. And, oh, it was, the devil was almost powerful enough to defeat God. I want you to see something in this verse. This is not God. This is not Jesus. This is not the Holy Spirit. It's just an angel. <laughs> just some guy. Probably the closest one at the time. <laughs> I don't know. There's no descriptors to tell us if this angel is particularly powerful or not. But I want you to see that with, with no contest, this angel, in my mind, this is my imagination, he grabs Satan by the throat, just go! And he's holding him up and his feet are dangling, and yet we've got this mindset that there's this, there's this contest, there's this battle going on, and Satan is so powerful. No, he's not. Just one angel. Say it with me. Say one angel. Just one angel grabs Satan by the throat, the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. He just grabs him. And we know it's with one hand 
because he has another hand to bind him up with chain, that heavy chain. He's like, I don't know how it's going to look, but it's something, right? And then I love what it says. It says he opens up the bottomless pit. He doesn't say he sets them down in there nicely. It doesn't say he tossed them in there gently. It says he threw him in to the bottomless pit. How many of you would agree that that, according to the text here, that is a no contest situation, right? That is, if, so if you've been afraid of the devil, if you get all spooked out about demony things, you need to wake up, honey child, and realize that our God is an awesome God. Our God is a powerful God. The Bible actually says that when we see him, we'll be like, this is the one who tormented the ages? Say, this is not a close contest. It's not. It's not almost, it's not, it's not a narrow victory, just it's all about God's timing. And when God says now's the time, when God says next, just one angel is going to grab Satan by the throat, wrap him up in chains, and throw him into the bottomless pit, and then lock the pit. I don't know why it's necessary <laughs> to lock the pit, but who am I to question God's system? So let's keep reading. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, the people on those thrones, do you, raise your hand if you know who they are, just wondering. Good, I'm glad I'm informing most of you. The people on those thrones are you and me. It's the church. We're the ones that are given authority to judge. I don't know the specifics. I don't know exactly how that works out, but that is who is on the thrones. The people who were beheaded refers to people who lived during the tribulation but refused to accept the mark of the beast or worship his system. This is what we call tribulation saints. So there will be people that are, that maybe you just aren't living your life right with God when the rapture happens. Maybe you're not yet saved when the rapture happens. But that doesn't mean that all hope is lost for you. So if you find yourself in that situation, pay attention right now. Because the most important thing you can do is do not take the mark of the beast. Do not worship the statue. Do not worship his image. And do not, because according to the word of God, you're probably going to lose your head over it. But there's a far greater price that you could pay. So the tribulation saints are the people that do not worship the devil, that don't become part of that system during the tribulation. There will be a literal millennial reign for a thousand years with Jesus on the earth. This will be to restore Israel and to eradicate evil from this earth once and for all. This will not be only spiritual, as some denominations suggest. It will not be metaphorical, and it has not already happened, as some try to suggest. But it will happen, and you and I need to be ready for it. Amen? Now, for those who fear that heaven will be an eternal church service, I think one of the saddest things that I see in our culture today is when I hear young people say, well, I hope that Jesus doesn't come back before this happens or this because our perspective of, our, our view is that this is better than what's coming. And then it doesn't matter when it happens, someone's going to have not yet been married, someone's going to have not yet had kids, Someone's going to have not gone to college. So there's someone's going to miss out on things. But let me promise you something, that what's next for the Christian is better than what is now. Amen? So if you're afraid it's going to be an eternal church service, look at this. Look at verse 7. When the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as the sands of the seashore. Oh, I want you to get that visual. This is the culmination of all the evil that has taken place from Adam to the very end. So this will be the greatest army that has ever been, at least it's implied here, that it will be the, just the, the, 
the strongest army that's ever been assembled, and they will be coming against God. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. So I can only imagine that on that day, that for those of us that have been reigning with Christ for a thousand years, that now it looks like we're in trouble. We are completely surrounded. There are more who are against us than are for us. But look at this. But fire came down from heaven on the attacking armies and consumed them. <laughs> Again, no contest, no real threat. God just sent down fire poof, and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in, these, in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and the death gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. It says death and the grave. That's what was throwing me off. Death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And listen to this. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Today, I want to encourage you with these words. Today, you can make sure that your name is written in the book of life. You can repent of your sins, and you can give your heart to Jesus and choose to follow him from this day forward. Are you ready to make that choice? Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. And friends, let me tell you today that if we do not receive the lamb, we will be forced to face the lion. Mm -hmm.